The Cybertruck has over 1.5 million reservations and it will certainly break the internet soon enough when deliveries start. People will be posting test drives and other videos of the futuristic vehicle. But Monroe Live wants to beat anyone trying to do a teardown of the Cybertruck. They say they'll likely offer double for what you bought it for. When are you going to do the Cybertruck? That should be a little as bit straightforward, right? As soon as possible. Right? As soon yeah, as, as soon possible. As you, so who has, have, who has the re reservation for one? <laughs> so we have like five different people with them on order, all with the yeah. understanding that whoever gets theirs first <laughs> will tear down. But most likely what's going to happen is we'll probably buy one on the secondary market mm -hmm. at a premium. So whoever gets theirs first in the country or in the first week yeah. will immediately be able to sell it for double. And we most likely will pay that. So if you're out there watching and you get yours within a cyber truck, sell it. Yeah. A week, sell it. Yeah. And we'll buy it and we'll tear it down. Yeah, this is a clip from an interview with Herbert Ong of Brighter with Herbert. He's interviewing Corey Steuben, and after popular demand, I just interviewed Corey myself. You're really? you're kind of like this rising star in the Tesla community, and people love Sandy, but they love you too, Corey. So Corey is the president of Monroe and Associates. Sandy Monroe, of course, gets a lot of the attention and limelight, but in just two months, these two interviews with Corey have generated over 500,000 views combined. I also posted a short video from a brief conversation with Corey while I was live streaming from a hospital bed, and many of you asked, where's the full interview? Well, here it is by popular demand. But I wanted to make this interview unique and not be as Tesla heavy as the others were. Don't worry, we still talk Tesla, but I wanted you to hopefully learn something new in my video, like how Corey takes lessons from his job at a Burger King and still applies them today, or how Corey is the one to thank for a change in a popular minivan that hardly anyone is probably aware of. Let's get into it. I have some questions from viewers, and I guess we'll we'll start with kind of the easiest one here. Uh, where did you go to college, and what was your life before Sandy? Ooh, great question. So my life with Sandy and college are kind of combined because I did all my internships at Monroe & Associates. So I started at Monroe when I was 18. And my story of how I got to Michigan is kind of interesting. My uh, best friend, Ross, he, uh, we went to kindergarten together. We went to grade school, high school. His older brother went to Kettering University in Flint, Michigan. And his older brother was maybe six or eight years older than him. His name was Ryan. And I always knew that my best friend's brother went to this crazy school in Michigan where you could get a job right away and you would work half the year. So Kettering University has a co-op program. They call it a co-op program because you actually work six months out of the year. You go to school six months. And lo and behold, I show up to Kettering and you have to get a job. Like it's not negotiable. It's not like, oh, I might get an internship. You have to. So there was a job fair in, I think, September of 2005. I went to that job fair and Monroe had this really sad looking brown table with nothing behind it. And there was a guy standing there and his name was Ryan. And I, I only walked up to him because there was huge lines at General Motors and Ford and Continental. So I walked up to him, started chatting with uh, Ryan and I got hired um, at Monroe as an intern because my father was a mechanic and we do teardowns. So they knew I would be good with tools because on my resume, I had privately commissioned automotive repair. And I actually did a lot of my own automotive repair. So I came from Nebraska moved to Michigan to go to school and immediately got a job at Monroe. So I started at Monroe when there was only 25 employees. I was employee number 47. So from 1988 till when I got hired, there was only 47 people ever hired. And then there was 25 people at the company. And I was just in a review right now. We're up to employee number 290 and we have about a hundred employees, you know, employed. So that was my life before Monroe, Nebraska, Kettering, and now I'm here. So that's crazy. So you basically just went in the in the the no line. The other lines were too long, and mm -hmm. then I'm sure you're so glad you did because, like, look at how awesome things have evolved. Yeah, and I'm 
I'm a firm believer that no matter what fork you take in life, uh, positive things follow the perspective and perseverance of the person. So I've had, had a couple of forks in the road. Like I actually had to decide between Monroe and another company in Grand Rapids that made cooking equipment. And the reason why I was interested in the cooking equipment company was because I worked at Burger King for five years and I loved it. I knew how to maintain all the equipment. I had efficiency improvements for the franchise in Lincoln, Nebraska with how the dishes were done. I could, I mean, I could do three people's jobs. I could make all the Whoppers, all the Junior Whoppers and do the fry station and the fish and chicken station. So they would, they would, they would uh, schedule me or three people. And I took a huge amount of pride in being able to do my job really well. So when I went to apply for these internships, I, I got an offer from Monroe and I got an offer from this cooking equipment company. And there was a fork in the road. And I always picture where would I be if I would have taken that job in Grand Rapids? I, I truly believe I'd be in some similar scenario in some alternate universe where I'm now the CEO of whatever that cooking confectionery company was. So I'm not, you know, I, I love what we do at Monroe. I think I'm going to look back in 30 or 40 years, the time that I got, that I get to spend with Sandy, it'll be like, I'll, I'll talk to people and they'll say, no way you traveled around the world with Sandy for five years. I'll be like, yes, I did. I love it. Yeah, that that is so cool. Well, and the real question is, is there actually an alternate universe and you you are CEO of that company in that alternate universe? <laughs> I don't know. We don't that's know. A, that's a question for uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, or <laughs> who's the everyday astronaut guy. Yeah. yeah. Um, before we get into some of these questions, I didn't know that uh, just about you working in fast food. So is there anything interesting or any misconception or something that we don't know about the fast food industry? I learned more about industrial engineering and processing at in my five years working at Burger King than I did in college, taking my IE and processing course. Some of these multi-billion dollar organizations are such well-oiled machines. And if you're out there and you work in a job, you work at Amazon, you work, maybe you're young and you work at McDonald's or Burger King, look at how the machine works. The machine that makes the products, meaning the equipment that's there, the position of everything, whether you work at Starbucks, it's very carefully refined by these multi-billion dollar organizations. And if you look at how the food comes in, how the packaging is very Spartan, you know, it, there's, they eliminate as much waste as possible because they're trying to make as much profit as possible. So the larger the organization, the bigger, the more advantage you have of studying how the operation works. And if you work at a small mom and pop place, you actually will see a ton of inefficiencies in packaging and and how things are made and waste. And uh, I, I apply things that I learned when I worked at Burger King to my engineering career still to this day. That's crazy. That's really interesting. Um, I will say that part of what prompted this interview right now is I made a short from, you know, that that anecdote oh, yeah. you had about Elon's like time management, I guess. And and what I remember most about Elon, he was intently focused. He sat at the table. There was no papers, no phone, no computer. It was the screen was up on the wall, like past the table. About an hour into it, his assistant brought in a glass plate with a portobello mushroom burger on it and a glass of what looked like Diet Coke. He didn't even look at her didn't even look at the food, continued to work, and then grabbed his silverware and cut it in half and ate it and drank most of the Diet Coke. And then she took the plate away. It's like he didn't even invest any mental energy into looking at his food. It was incredible. It was one thing that I picked up on. Since that day, I've outsourced my lunch. I now have my lunch delivered to work. It sits on my desk and I don't make the decision as to what I get my secretary, which is my credit card, because I'm like, if Elon Musk is not going to waste any time thinking about his food, you know what? I'm going to take that hour back every single day for the rest of my life. Not choosing his lunch and you're outsourcing your lunch. 
And some people like criticize that saying, this is what's wrong with hustle culture. What do you say to that? Yeah, I wouldn't say it's hustle culture. It's, there's a certain point where time becomes so much more valuable than money. And, and, and I came from some of the most humble beginnings. So my parents, my mom never worked. She was a stay-at-home mom. She, she raised us. My dad owned his own business, but he had struggles at times. I lived in a, a modest home in Nebraska, but when I was 14 and 15, my parents said, if you want something, you have to work for it and buy it. So I paid for my first vehicle and I did all my own maintenance. And even when I was 19, 20, 21, I ate canned tuna from Aldi and free oatmeal and popcorn that Monroe, Monroe provided. Like that was my sustenance for the better part of three years of my life because I, I was making intern wages and paying my way through school. And there's a certain point where time becomes so much more valuable that you realize it finally makes sense to let go. And it took me a long time. I st still did all my own car maintenance up until like three years ago. And finally, I had to, I bought newer vehicles that, that, that have warranties and stuff. Um, so I think I actually still have, hang on, let me see. Yeah, here's my delivery today. Beyond Juice 3 and Eatery. Yeah, let me see. Right here. They put a little smiley face on it. $24.31 for a Chipotle chicken, honey, wheat wrap, egg white, and then a little drink. It's the best money I spend every day. So if people are criticizing that it's hustle culture, then time, uh, money is still more valuable than time to them. And it's something I never thought I'd hit that point. But I now pay for uh, house cleaning because I have three small children. And I always prided myself on cleaning the bathrooms and the floors. But the amount of time it takes to clean my house is way more, I'm trying to explain it. It's way more valuable for me to pay $95 or $100 for someone to come clean it every week than for me to dedicate half my Saturday. I spend that time with my children. We actually, I bought a kite. We were flying a kite. We go to the library. We, you know, I spend really valuable time with my children and my in-laws and my wife. So I don't waste it. It's not that I spend this money and then I then also go hang out with my buddies and guy friends. I really invest all that time in either my health, whether that's exercising or running or with my family. Yeah, no, I, uh, I thought I, I, it makes sense to me, but it was interesting to read the comments, but people were really intrigued by that story for sure. And, and it makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So it's funny. You said you, you read the comments. I don't, I don't, I'll read comments in general, but I don't dwell on some negative comments. So if people want to criticize the fact that they're even typing a response means that we're making an impact in the world, positive or negative. And we always leave, we leave 99.9% .9 of all the comments on our YouTube videos, even when they're super negative. Even if they're making fun of people, if they make fun of people's weight, their hair, whether they're bald, whether they're short, we leave it only when it crosses the line. If it's like inciting violence, uh, sexist or racist, or, you know, in a, that's something we'll delete. But usually we allow everything and people will criticize us for that. We don't know anything, that we're stupid, that we're wrong. We leave it because I'm I'm a. I kind of align with Elon being a free speech absolutionist to a point where you should be able to speak your mind. So if somebody thinks that that I have a hustle culture because I cater my luncheon, then they can think that. <laughs> and you'll save the time either way. Yeah. <laughs> um, so when I first met you at Cyber Rodeo, you were wearing matching shirts with oh, someone God. who I thought was your dad. I'm sure you get a lot of people think that you are Sandy's son. Very few, actually. Really? Okay, just me? <laughs> my, my last name, Corey Steuben, Sandy Monroe. Um, I guess if you didn't know my name, 
then maybe. Sandy does have a son who lives in Canada. His name is Alistair. Um, he, he's in his 40s, I believe. Um, but no, I am not a son. No. Some, but... some, sometimes Sandy says that I'm like a son to him. Yeah. But like I said, the connection to Monroe started from that chance interview that I got through the job fair. But the alignment with me wanting to work at Monroe, you know, the fact that they did teardowns, they did automotive teardowns. We actually work in a lot of other industries. We're in the defense industry, construction, agriculture industry. So some of the first things I worked on were uh, a plane developed in Brazil, a rice planter, uh, a, a big combine rice planting machine. I worked on skid steers, which are like bobcats, you know, with the little front loader four wheels they kind of spin around i worked on a big project there i worked on a fuse so uh, all these like crazy things were more in monroe's repertoire back then we were less automotive we're actually like 50 percent other stuff and like 50 percent automotive and i was always a big car guy i did auto racing when i was younger my dad was a mechanic so I was a fit for Monroe. It's not that Monroe was a fit for me. When I was 18, I just wanted a job and I wanted a job that, that paid a lot. And they chose me because my skill set, because my dad was a mechanic, Matt. And then everything I've learned has been at Monroe, which is an advantage sometimes. And it's also a disadvantage because when we're hiring people, we oftentimes like to bring in people who have 10 to 15 years of experience whether they were at an OEM or a supplier, because they come in and they make our engineers, engineering team better because they're, they're bringing other, other viewpoints that kind of bolster us as a whole. So I'm a lifer at Monroe, but then again, I've got to support, you know, five dozen projects with all these other companies all over the world. And I've learned from that before I transitioned into management. Wow. What what has been your favorite project or, or teardown? Ooh, my favorite project. I can't speak to the specifics of it still. It's actually super boring. Um, it's okay. a minivan. So we had the we had the joy of helping a large OEM as they started the development of their new minivan. And this was probably a decade ago, 2011 or 12. So we started when they were at the sketch phase and I was younger at the time. So I worked, Monroe worked as a benchmarking liaison to their advanced concept engineering team. So what that means is as they were developing the size, the shape, what was going to be in it, where was the spare tire going to be? How big was the engine? What's the materials? We had like a, a front row seat to the formation of what that vehicle was. And there was that we hit all these different snags where they had to have decisions. So then they would ask Monroe to go benchmark, you know, what does the whole the whole world do for spare tire mounting? And okay, this one does underneath the car, this one does it in the car, this one doesn't even have a spare tire. So we do all these studies and our, our input was actually really well received and used in the decision making process. So we ended up supporting that from like concept or sketch stage all the way until it launched in the plant. And I followed it from like 2011 all the way to 2017. So it was like seeing a child being born. And there was a few things on that vehicle that I'm ultimately proud of, and it sounds boring, but it's how the rear shock mounts. So they were developing this minivan off of an old platform. And the old platform used KUKA pallets, which are KUKA is a tooling supplier, that had vertical spindles that spun screws up like this. So when you bring the body down on the chassis, a lot of the bolts screw up. So they were using these cups. They look like aluminum cups on top of the shock where the bolts went through so they could screw up. Well, the cups were made of aluminum. They were heavy. They were expensive. And then the structure in the body was also heavy and steel and expensive. And when I benchmarked the competition, Ford and Honda all used this very simple bar that looked like this where you ran two screws through it sideways mm. so by running the screws through sideways you eliminated the aluminum cup you eliminated all the structure because you were mounting to the side and it was like in sheer 
So I pitched this and it came, it was a lot of resistance. So like, oh no, we have this tooling in the plant. I'm trying to tell the story as fast as I can. And I fought it. It was like my, it was like my religion is to get this vehicle to switch how the rear shock mount. And now for the past six years, any one of these minivans you see on the planet has rear shocks that screw in from the side, very similar to how Ford and Toyota did it. It was Ford and Toyota or Ford and Honda. I don't remember now. And I know that that saved that vehicle seven to eight dollars per vehicle and three pounds. That said, it's three pounds of mass that it's not carrying. So it's adding to the fuel efficiency and the efficiency of something that no one on the planet cares about. How many people actually care how the rear shock mounts in a minivan? I do. I fought the battle and I didn't get any credit because when you're a consultant, you're, you're trying to we had badges. So it was like we worked for these OEMs. Right. We had computers. We would go in meetings. We were in the headquarters and we were just part of the team that helped move the needle to make the vehicle lighter, easier to build, more economical. And we fought battles like that all the time. And this was younger in my career. So I was probably in my early 20s. And I'd go into meetings with all these directors and VPs in their you know, 40s and 50s, and I didn't care. And and a lot of times when people on Monroe Live are really eloquent, like Jordan and Scott Hoffman and Tyler, and a lot of times in the comments, people are like, wow, these Monroe people, they, they really know how to explain stuff like Carl. It's because we have a decade of experience presenting yeah. really technical information to a, a really scary crowd. So put us in front of an iPhone 13, 14 Pro and have us tell the world about how something is, is put together. Easy. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, no, you, you do seem very confident that. So, and you can't disclose what exactly the, or who exactly the company is, right? You can, you can figure it out. Okay. Yeah. Minivan. And then you can look up where Monroe is located. I mean, hello. <laughs> Okay. If you can't figure it out by that, then okay. Yes. Okay. There's not there's not that many minivans in the world. Okay. So. Um, how do you balance like creating content because you have like all of this traveling and mm -hmm. engagements and stuff that you didn't have in your schedule a few years ago on top of your actual like work and purpose. Um, it got to the point where we were overworking Sandy in early 2021. So the first year of Monroe Live, it was the pandemic and we, I made a decision to only put Sandy on the camera. And there was a reason behind that. There's a lot of other people at Monroe that kind of wanted the limelight. And they're like, oh, I'm gonna be on the videos. And people love Sandy. So the first hundred videos, I think it was just Sandy. And it wasn't until like our 92nd video where he even asked for subscribers. Like we made it that long where we didn't want to be like every other YouTube channel. But what we found was it was too taxing for our team to prepare Sandy. So we have our team that's doing the teardown, like Scott Hoffman and Jordan, all these people. And they would spend two hours going over what Sandy needed to present. And then Sandy would present it and bless his heart, he would do a good job, but he would like miss key details or he'd say two words wrong. And then we'd have to like mm -hmm. edit it. It was like, man. And then at a certain point, um, Sandy was getting burnt out. And he's like, I just can't do this anymore. Cause we wanted him to do two videos a week, three videos a week. And we started integrating other people on the channel. Um, I started going on there with Sandy because I'm like a walking encyclopedia. I don't forget things. I remember things, details. And Sandy be talking, you know, wah, 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 my name's Sandy. And then I would, I knew how to like pull information out of him or ask him questions or guide the video. So Sandy and I together was a thing for a while. And then we put our other people on and now we have like a dozen people who have been on camera and probably six who are on camera regularly. And it's really lowered the burden on Sandy. That was the first thing. Yeah. And then when it, when it comes to content creation, 
um, the first year, it was another engineer, his name is Tyler, Tyler Schlink, and myself, we did it all, we did it all. So we were doing the video, the, the videography, the editing, and the uh, heated audio and the thumbnail. Our, our thumbnails were horrible. Our editing wasn't any good and our videography wasn't very good in retrospect now. But we were so proud that we got to 120,000, we got to 140,000 subscribers without any professional videography service, service at all. It was an engineer and me with no background in producing, editing, nothing. And finally, after the Elon interview, we, we were so burnt out, we're like, we gotta hire people. And we hired two videographers. And then we've since added Aaron as our uh, graphic designer who primarily does our graphics and our thumbnails, which are so important that we have a full-time employee and that team, I think, produced over 550 discrete videos last year. So I think roughly 150 long form videos on YouTube, because we do three a week, every week, sometimes four. And then from those long form content, we also have another 350 or 400 short form vertical film for Instagram, Reels, Snapchat, TikTok. Twitter. Now we do a lot on Twitter as well. Um, but I, I'm trying to think of your original question. How do you handle it? We now have an amazing team. So it started off, it was very taxing. And now we have that team of three that handles all the back end, all the videography and filming. So Sandy and I, when we travel, it's not so bad. And like, like you saw, when we went to Texas, we brought Grace and Aaron there. Um, to film and capture and edit so that Sandy and I didn't have to think about it. Cause usually uh, when Sandy and I travel, I was the one who was doing the film. So yeah. then I, I couldldn't talk to people. I couldn't meet people. Yeah. Um, people just was like, Oh, you must be a videographer. Still to this day, when I went in for the Elon interview, I showed up with all the equipment and I'm filming. And I asked Sandy, I said, please, when you get in there, just introduce me as the president of Monroe. Did he? No, he forgot. He was too nervous. <laughs> so he never, he's like, oh, this is Corey, the president. Of, nope. He just was sitting there. All, I filmed the whole thing. He was sitting there giddy. Oh, you know, whatever. You had one job. I, I think Elon probably knows who I am. I have uh, one like and one comment from him on Twitter. You know, that too is, is a lot. Yeah. And uh, then I had that Jeff Bezos comment the other day. That was oh, good. I didn't know yeah. about that. Oh, yeah. So, and the cross section of Bezos and Elon is pretty rare. I, I uh, Jeff Bezos follows me on Twitter, Monroe Live on Twitter, and Monroe and Associates on Twitter. You can yeah. look it up. Yeah, go on Twitter. I didn't know I don't that. Wanna, I didn't want to ruin it. I thought it was accidental, but so I was Jeff Bezos 100th follow, follow. He follows me. So Wow. Elon follows Sandy. So, and Sandy's part of our ecosystem. You know, he runs his Twitter, but we really help him. You know, we, we will film videos for him and we'll <laughs> coax him like, hey, you need a tweet. So in our DM, we can DM Elon or we can DM Bezos. And uh, I won't disclose whether we do or not, whether they respond, but you can, yeah. once, once you're following access. each other. We got that access. The channel's open. So Elon has commented twice now and liked once on mine. And it's been uh, three uh, months in a row, January comment, February comment, March like, and the like was it within three hours of me posting. Nice. So I was like, he's on to, he's seeing somehow my stuff. Look at that. That's five, five of his 24,000 tweets. Yeah. I don't know how many likes. <laughs> That's a pretty good percentage. You know, <laughs> well, and it's crazy just seeing like the the aftermath of him liking it, or more so commenting, but like the impressions that that tweet gets after he yeah. comments are wild. Has it made a difference to have additional help and pay people to delegate and have help with the social media? Because I feel like I'm at that like 
that turning point of like, I either need, you know, it's, it's a lot for one yeah. person, but then it's like, is it economical? So it, it, if the business case makes sense. So at, at Monroe, we're an engineering firm. So all of our marketing efforts before 2020, before the channel, we wouldn't make money back on it. We would pay $10,000 to be in a magazine or something. And maybe we would see an ROI on that, but usually not. So usually our spending on marketing and advertising, we would lose money. So we look at our YouTube channel. We want it to be a very covert, subtle way to tell the world what we do. When you watch it, you may not see it. All it is is our engineers explaining something cool that we tore down. But through the, the intellect and the detail that our people are espousing, if you're, if you're watching that as an engineer, like, man, these people know what they're talking about. And in the comments, in the description, it says, reach out to Monroe and email us at salesleandesign.com. And we get thousands of emails asking for work because of that. So we use it as a marketing arm. So even if we didn't make money on it, we would still do it and lose money. But we make money. Um, we make money. Uh, we cover our expenses just from YouTube ad revenue. Um, so we've tailored the team to the amount of people. So if I made more YouTube ad revenue, I'd grow the team. If I doubled the YouTube ad revenue, I'd add another person so that we can continue to grow. Because I look at it as an investment. And um, we're starting a, an actual bona fide podcast. We built a podcast studio. We bought the professional headphones, the professional mics. We have permanent lighting. We're even going to create another channel. We're going to create a second channel. And we've lined up like eight amazing interviews of people that are four or five of them have two million, three million, five million followers. So some are social media people. And then other people are, you know, in industry. Um, this was air so we're actually ready to split. And because we didn't want to fill Monroe Live with all these podcasts, and we have this really great strategy of how we're going to film the long form podcast, um, how we're going to immediately create all these shorts from it to then like put on Facebook and YouTube shorts and all this other stuff. So we're growing and expanding. And to answer your question, it is worth it if you can see the business case paying off. And, and for us, when we first started Monroe Live, I was pumped when we made $300 on a video. Now we'll release a video that'll get uh, a couple hundred thousand views and we'll make five grand on it. Like Sandy and I talking about Investor Day, for 25 minutes, we made five grand just in ad revenue. Because the CPM was like, I don't, I don't remember RPM and CPM, like yeah. revenue per mill or the high one. It was like $29. Yeah. It was, it was incredible. So that was actually a factor in us flying to Texas. Because I told Sandy, I said, let's go to Texas. He's like, ah, okay. So we had to buy two flights. We had to buy two flights for the videographers. So you're adding it up. The flights are like 700 bucks. You got three grand. Uh, Sandy and I got some free lodging. The the ladies had to stay at a hotel. So we probably spent five grand going to Texas. Well, we made that back on that one video. So even our trips, we kind of we kind of weigh like, what will we get out of this? How much content can we create? How relevant will it make us? Well, because Sandy and I flew to Texas, we then got invited. We didn't have tickets before we went. A lot of people are like, oh, you got tickets? Oh, heck no. We got ours the last minute. We got in. And then because we were in there, I did several consulting calls for 1200 bucks an hour because I was there. You know, people were like, oh, my God, what did you see? And, you know, I just we, we do engineering consulting calls. So it adds a lot of credence to our consulting repertoire. The fact that we've been to Vietnam and been in a, the VinFast plant. I've been to Giga, Texas. I've been invited to go tour another Tesla factory in the next like two months. I won't reveal which one, but I, you know, that may come through. But anyways, there was a long answer to your question. How do you balance it? 
we're better about it now. Yeah. And we have a really good team of three. Right. It's kind of like an evolution. This question is, what is the best next use for space alloys in a Tesla? I don't know. I don't know how literal they want me to take this. So space alloys. So you have high end aluminum alloys, like 7,000, 6,000 series aluminum alloys. You have really high end alloys for ultra high strength steel, which you wouldn't consider space alloys, but they're already in use. And then you also have other exotic alloys like titanium alloys, like what's in your legs, probably. Um, so it, space alloys is very generic. And oftentimes an automobile, the best choice for the material is a mid-grade steel. So look at the cradles for the Model 3 and the Model Y and the suspension links. The rear suspension links are all steel. Um, only recently did they upgrade to, to forged aluminum. Um, but when they launched, they were steel. The cradles are steel. Um, the body sides are steel. And the giga castings are aluminum. Now, they did develop their own aluminum to be able to cast that without heat treating. They've talked about that extensively. So the question is, what's the best next use for space alloys in Tesla? Well, frankly, if you can design a vehicle without the need for space alloys, then you're actually ahead because some of the most efficient vehicles from a cost and user perspective, meaning what the user pays and what the vehicle costs to build are basic stamped steel construction for suspension components and simple aluminum casting. And the more exotic that you get to solve some sort of engineering problem, like the giga casting, that's enabling this next generation of assembly process because the castings are now so large, they can create that huge front assembly, the rear assembly and the body sides and the battery pack. So it, without being more specific on space alloys, I just give my general response is, if you're trying to solve an incredibly difficult problem with a super unique material, it's it's usually because the problem demands it. And that's why you see exotic materials used in race cars. Carbon fiber and titanium, the things that are machined from billet, are those are all in F1 race cars because they're like at peak performance. But if you're buying a vehicle for 50 grand, 60 grand, 40 grand, 30 grand, you want it to be steel and aluminum and basic alloys. Space alloys aren't needed unless you're in a super high performance, uh, high performance um, need environment. Cool. <laughs> Glad that you could answer that. Um, this person wants to know, will Toyota survive being so late to the BEV or BEV market? I'm not sure how you pronounce it. Oh, I know it's a battery electric vehicle, but do you say BEV or BEV for the acronym? I say BEV. BEV. Okay. Uh, the answer is yes. Survive is relative. People use the word survive. I think they should replace it with thrive. Survival is easy. Thriving is another thing. So leadership is key when it comes to committing to electrification. And some OEMs, will talk a big game, but they're not delivering. They'll say, we're gonna spend 10 billion or 20 billion or 30 billion, and uh, we're gonna introduce 10 new BEVs over the next five years, and we're gonna lead the world and we're leading. But then you look at how many vehicles they, produ they produced and delivered in the past year, and it's in like, it's still under 100,000 in the US market, I believe, for some of these that are talking a big game. But when Toyota, when they say they're gonna do something, the Japanese culture is different. And they're very, uh, they're very dedicated and committed to their leadership's direction. So if they decide this is the way, 
and they're going to start making BEVs on BEV dedicated platforms, I think that they'll have enough carryover knowledge from their near two decades of producing hybrids because there's a lot of carryover. So if you look at battery packs, high voltage wiring, gear train, NVH characteristics, because hybrids run as electric only, you know, when the engine shut off. So there's a ton of uh, knowledge that Toyota has learned from having, you know, whatever hundreds of thousands or millions of Priuses out on the road. And they have a lot of hybrids like RAV4 hybrid and whatnot is a really popular hybrid. So they'll be able to translate a lot of their learnings there because we've seen their electronics and their units, and their motors and their batteries improve in their hybrids over the last 15 years. They'll, they won't be starting from cold. They'll be able to expand those battery packs, expand those electric drive lines, integrate it into a BEV only platform. Will they be late? Probably a little later, but if they move quickly, they'll be able to catch up to the other legacy OEMs like VW and GM that I think are have been talking a big talk for three or four years, but haven't been delivering. So that was my point, is a lot of the other OEMs have been talking, but not delivering. Toyota may be late to talking, but if they move quickly, they can match the delivery cadence of some of the larger OEMs that'll probably roll out a large portfolio of battery electric vehicles in the next two and a half to five years. I'm curious, do you drive a Tesla? No. I don't drive a Tesla either. I do have a hybrid though, but yeah, I I I very publicly have stated what I drive. So I live on a dirt road. I have three children, a large dog, a wife, and I drive a Yukon XL with a diesel. I drive a diesel vehicle. And people are like, "Oh, but it has an after treatment system. It's never puffed a puff of black smoke. I get 26 to 30 miles per gallon and the vehicle weighs like six or 7,000 pounds. So I've stated this before. People have asked me, they're like, well, why don't you drive a Tesla Model 3 or a Model Y? It would be worthless for my, my life and my activities because I, I drive on this stretch of dirt road that has huge potholes. And if you have low, medium to low profile tires, people bend their rims all the time. I need a tr like essentially it's like a truck suspension. So if Ford or GM or Toyota or Tesla came out with a large three row SUV, I would buy it. Now the Rivian R1S, I had it, I drove it home, too small, way too small. I put two of my kids in there and my dog, and it was like no room. I just need either that or a minivan that's electric. Give me that. I'll drive that. <laughs> An Econoline van. A big Econoline van, nine passenger. I'll take that too. But they just don't exist. So as soon as they come out, I will buy one. And the one luxury of having a non-BEV of uh, vehicles that I'm driving to Nebraska on Friday. It's 700 miles. When I fill my tank up, it says 690 miles of range. Like imagine having 690 miles of range in an electric uh, SUV that size. It's just not there yet. Now yeah. granted, I'll stop several times, I know. And if there's any listeners out there, I think Sandy and I have more road trip miles in a continuous road trip than anyone I've ever, we did 7,998 like miles in one road trip in 11 days. Our huge road trip in a Model 3, we charged like 48 times, all supercharging. And it was all free. We had free supercharging for a year, so we just drove everywhere. I know I don't own an electric vehicle. Don't hate me. I, I'm, I'm not a Tesla evangelist. I'm a pragmatist. I like practical, pragmatic tools for my life. <laughs> okay. It's fair. It's fair. I mean, I took my first road trip in a Tesla and it was fine, but we did have to stop a lot and the stops were longer and, you know, so it's, yeah. um, yeah, I get it. I get it. Um, I'd like a Tesla, but they're, they're expensive still for me. So. Yeah. And technically my name is on the registration of our model S plaid and our model three. So technically the state of Michigan, 
thinks that I own a Model 3. So <laughs> I could have just lied and said, yes, I yeah. own a Model 3. And I have an Ionic. There's a Hyundai Ionic. I, also, I bought that the other day. We're going to tear that down. Um, yeah, that's news. Um, starts in the next week or two. Okay. Um, we needed something to fill the space until we get our cyber truck. We needed another tear down and cyber people have truck, asked for it. But also the semi, any movement on that? So we've raised like 15% of the money needed for it. We tried to do a fundraiser, but I think we're still really far out on a semi. If we can, if we can acquire one, we'll get one by all means and tear down, but they're, they're really hard to get because people don't want to destroy them. People who get them use them. And I don't even think there's a secondary market for them. Usually we'll go on the secondary market. Like people will get them and then they'll try and sell it for a huge profit. It'll probably end up being hundreds, hundreds of thousands of dollars of, of a markup. We can't stomach that just to satisfy YouTube for seeing what's inside of it. Wow. That's crazy though, that you think that it's going to be that, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, I guess successful. Do you do you do you like the semi Tesla Tesla semi? Well, I got it. I got to climb in it when I was in Texas at the plant. At the end of the day, an electrified truck is not that like groundbreaking because large things have been electrified for decades or centuries. Like trains are diesel electric. They're essentially electric with a diesel generator. Like a lot of people don't realize that when you hear a train go by, there's this huge diesel engine running. It's just generating electricity to run the electric motor, you know? So having big electric motors and batteries moving a truck is still a frame. It's got the same wheels and tires. Sure, the cab is different. It's got the screen. It's just not as awe inspiring to me as like a cyber truck or the, the model why octoval like these really crazy solutions to problems that oems didn't know they had it's just it's harder for me to get excited about this is the last uh like formal question how long for a battery manufacturer to make alterations to improve a battery so sandy and i just flew out to boston two weeks ago we visited ses battery here's a, a little replica of their of their battery and they make a pouch style battery that is lithium metal. Essentially, it's just solid. And I think it stands for solid energy systems. That's what SDS stands for. So they're claiming they can get 450 watt hours per kilogram. And I think current Tesla battery cells, depending on how you measure it, are in the high 200s to low 300s watt hours per kilogram. And they're using this really novel titanium uh, substrate to put the thin lithium on. So it's like lithium on copper or lithium on titanium. We're going to have a whole video on it. So what, I, what I'm getting at is they're working on it. There's like dozens of companies that have the next best thing. And what's going to happen is each one of them, I say, not each one of them, let's say 30% of them have one little piece of merit, like the way that they do the titanium uh, substrate for the lithium is great for aerospace applications for light weighting or high performance. This actually goes all the way back to that other question of super alloys. So the only reason you need to use titanium in your battery is to get an extreme amount of weight savings so that your watt hours per kilogram is very high so that the weight of your battery is very low, more power, less weight, meaning now you can put it in a, in a sports car and instead of having a thousand pound battery, you have a 600 pound battery. But are you willing to pay the premium for titanium throughout all your pouches to get there? Only in a high performance scenario. Otherwise you pay for the mass and put more battery in there. So there's companies out here like SDS that are working on that. We're going to visit solid power. We visited QuantumScape. I'd say be patient, but you'll see minute improvements, particularly to battery construction, getting to solid state or near solid, solid state, uh, reducing the cost of 
of manufacturing is also critical because if you can get the cost down, that makes batteries more affordable. So things that improve cost and things that improve volumetric and gravimetric efficiencies will ultimately speed up the adoption of EVs. You know, with um, Elon's master plan part three and you being at Investor Day, what are you the most excited for with Tesla uh, moving forward, maybe in the near term? of a year and then like five years? Near term would be the switch to 48 volt for the entire low voltage architecture. So I, I don't know if, you're, if your viewers are aware of how big of a deal that is. So essentially, if you've been working in the automotive industry for the past four decades and you're an electrical engineer, you know that 12 volts, which is the current voltage of like the core architecture of, an, of a low voltage for EV, is the wrong voltage for the wattage and energy demands of a, of a vehicle today. Hmm. 12 volts was great back in the 30s, 40, 40s or 50s when you just had like windshield wipers, your lights and an AM FM radio and, 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 and like a dome light. But now we have these heavy energy intensive systems like electric power steering and electric park brake, EPB huge amount of energy needed and big motors. And then you also have brake by wire. So electric vehicles don't have an engine. So if you don't have an engine, you're not generating vacuum. So you have to have an electric motor that creates vacuum, a vacuum pump that essentially is spinning to create vacuum if you're using a traditional brake booster. But usually they don't do that and they have uh, e-boost, e-brake. So they have an electric motor that's creating hydraulic pressure to then brake. These are high energy intensive systems and 12 volts is just atrocious for it because um, with a lower voltage, you end up having higher current. So you need bigger wires. So if you raise the voltage, uh, you end up reducing the need to have large wires and costly motors and whatnot. But the problem is every OEM, every OEM has considered this and some OEMs have deployed a few 48 volt components on the vehicle um, because they already had a hybrid battery. And if you already had a hybrid battery at 48 volts or 96 volts, they would match, they would take that voltage and they would run the electric power steering or the EPB, a few of the systems that were high energy and it saved them some money, but no one is committed to doing the whole dang car. You do the whole dang car, it is like a paradigm shift because it's all the little stuff that doesn't matter. When you get in your car and you lock the door, the motor, that the little actuator that locks it, that has to be 48 volts. It's the little stuff. All the sensors, the lights, everything, they're all 12 volts now. There's a whole supplier bases that all they do is make little 12 volt lights for cars. Millions of them, hundreds of millions, billions of them. Well, guess what? Now, if you have a 48 volt one, it's gonna be what? More expensive. So in the beginning, it'll be a really expensive switch because there's gonna be a lot of development that needs to happen. But once the pain of the switch is over, the, the OEMs that are producing vehicles with 48 volt systems for their low voltage uh, systems will have a huge advantage from a weight perspective which ultimately means you get more range mm -hmm. and a cost perspective. Once it, once the industry materializes, then the cost will be lower because you won't need so much wiring. You won't need so much copper. You can even replace the copper wiring with aluminum because typically you need copper so that it can be smaller. But if you switch to aluminum, it can actually grow in size because now you don't have as much uh, wattage, wattage draw. So 48 volt system, that's the biggest, the long answer, that's the biggest thing. Second, really close, was how the vehicles are assembled, their new assembly methodology, particularly because they'll be able to reduce the size of the paint shop probably by 50% because they no longer have to paint the entire body. So normally they're sending the whole volume of the body. So picture mm -hmm. the whole the car as a body going through. They have to have the robot going all around and get it in. And now you're going to send through both sides at the same time and and then the hood and the fender you can send it through flat like this if you send it through flat you only have to paint one side 
So now your, your, the articulation of your robots, how you paint can completely change. It'll be a body shop like no other. That's going to be a huge advantage. And then uh, lastly uh, is the Tesla operating system. The fact that they announced that they internalize the development of all their own internal software. They rely on less and less third-party software platforms from invoicing to, to payments. Um, that's incredible because working at a small company, we have like a dozen software packages. Like we're using StreamYard right now, right? Mm -hmm. I love StreamYard. But imagine if you're Tesla, they'd create their own web webcasting system right. if this is what they did. And I also use Adobe Premiere. Right. We, I I use ADP for my, our uh, 401k. We use Bamboo for our HR software. I'm looking at my icons at the top of my screen. You know. I, I use all these software packages and they're all different and they all work kind of well, but they're way more powerful than what we use. And at Monroe, we don't have an internal software team developing these bespoke, perfectly tailored software packages. So from an operational perspective, that was kind of cool to hear. Any any thoughts or reactions to Giga Mexico? That um, I think the size, it's going to be twice as big. Right, I I heard I think it's be twice as big as Texas. Maybe I misheard that. I heard 18 million square feet instead of nine, something like that. So it's going to be twice as big, but how they build the cars is going to take 40% less space, which means uh, because they're going to build the new generation car, so that means their output will almost be four times as much as Giga Texas at max output so i'm doing the math you're talking millions of vehicles coming out of there million plus and that's right. a lot for a plant i heard some people like criticize that they chose mexico they thought that they should have you know another american factory versus mexico oh, come on. if you want a low-cost bed you got to spread the love you, you got we we built there's two plants in the u.s if you want to People are so, they're so selfish. They want everything. They want a low cost bev, but you want it built in the US. Do they not realize what we have to pay people in the US? It's good wages. I don't know what hourly workers make at Tesla, but it's probably the equivalent of 60 to $100,000 a year with overtime or more, plus benefits. And you can send the plant to Mexico and wages are less in Mexico, yes. But you can hire the best people for much less mm -hmm. than what we are paying someone in the United States, which drops your labor costs. And the Mach E's made in Mexico. All sort there's there's GM trucks made in Mexico. There's all sorts of vehicles made in Mexico. And if you're building it for the rest of the world, then um, uh, Mexico has more free trade agreements with other South American countries that the U.S. doesn't have. So it, building it in Mexico will allow you to export to South America and a couple other countries that we don't have free trade agreements with. So it'll help them avoid a lot of tariffs and stuff. Do we need a gigafactory in Canada? I know it's been hinted at um, before. Do you think that we need, that is the next place that they should look to? Need? I wouldn't say need. <laughs> Is it possible? Yeah. Yeah. Canada is small. I mean, there's only 40 million people in Canada. It's like California. Like people for, I know it's a country, it's probably Canadians listening, but it's like, come on. It's like Ontario, Toronto, and Montreal it is, and then you got Vancouver. Other than that, it's just like a huge, cold, know, cold <laughs> lake filled country of Canadians that, <laughs> yeah. It's like one tenth the size of, of one tenth, eh, slightly like 11% or 12% the population of the US. It's crazy. I mean, you said something when we were in, when we were in the hospital, we were not in the hospital when I was in the hospital and you were there virtually, you had an injury. Oh yeah. What it happened? To you? I don't remember. So I was a senior in high school, 
and I played football and we had a really good team. They ended up actually going undefeated even after I got injured, but it was the third game of the year. We were playing gut Catholic and I played for Pius X, the Catholic grade school. I was middle linebacker. I remember the play like it was yesterday. The play went to the right. I, they call it scraping. I scraped to the right. The guy got tackled. I stopped and someone hit me from the left right on the side of my knee and it went 90 degrees and I heard it sounded like wood breaking like if you took a dry piece of wood and then when it cracked it literally pop snap yep I tore my PCL my MCL and my LCL three of the four my ACL didn't tear because of the way it, the direction it went was like the loose direction of the ACL apparently it wasn't like so it's like when you eat chicken and you actually like you know, break the leg off, all that cracking and popping. Um, my knee swelled up to the size of like a, uh, of a bowling ball the next yeah. day because it to the, the LCL and MCL are technically not ligaments. They're thickenings of the capsule. The PCL is a ligament. The PCL ripped out of the bone. So the PCL never really tore. It actually just pulled the bone out where it attached. And then uh, the, the MCL ripped wide open and it bled all in my knee. So a lot of the pictures you're showing of your leg with that like blood underneath in the back of your leg, that looks like bruising. Yes. That's what my knee looked like. So it was excruciatingly painful when it happened. Then it went, well, I was in shock for a while. And then I couldn't even have surgery for two weeks because the swelling had to go down. And then I had full reconstructive knee surgery. They cut out the PCL. They put someone else's Achilles tendon in as my PCL. They drilled through my femur and my tibia. They sewed together the MCL. I couldn't even bend my knee to 90 degrees for like six months. Like it, I, I had to go to physical therapy. It was horrible. And uh, it happened in the fall. And by the time track season rolled around, I ran track, which is incredible now to think about it, to have a full knee reconstruction. And then I ran high school track and I PR'd in like the mile and the 800. Um, I was 220 pounds during football season. And, and after I got injured, I couldn't move. My leg like atrophied. I atrophied really bad. I ended up weighing 170 by the time track season rolled around. Lost like whatever, 50 pounds. And uh, so long story. I would show people, but that'd be weird if I lifted my knee up. So I have a huge scar on my knee. Oh, so we can both have scars now. <laughs> so you heard it too, because I heard the bone snap and it was like, holy, like no, no question what just happened. Yeah, your injury looks looked way more severe. Oh my God. Than yours? It, yeah, because you can see the bone all like jagged and it's not lined up mine it's all soft or semi-hard tissue whatever tendons are so you you couldn't actually like after it happened immediately it didn't swell up they carried me off the field and there was an orthopedic surgeon who his kid played on my team his name was dr duga richard duga he was actually the orthopedic surgeon and the doctor for the university of nebraska football team as well so he was like the best orthopedic surgeon. He was the guy who ended up fixing my knee anyways. So he came down there after I got injured and he grabbed my knee and he, he like did this and it like moved every which way. <laughs> and, you know, I think my parents were there and he just like looked at them and was like, he like shook his head no and whispered to them. And, and I'm like, am I going to be able to go, go back in the game? He goes, no, no. <laughs> He said, you're done. And I said, I'm done for, for today. He's like, you're done for the season. I'm like, oh, man, that was horrible. But wow. anyways, I hope your leg gets better quickly. I think it's crazy you're going to have an, a titanium rod in there forever. But that's kind of cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't see the point in going through another surgery. Um, a lot of people say they don't notice it. It's not a big deal. It doesn't cause them pain. I talked to a girl in Nebraska, funny enough, 
I was in a fitness group doing an ab challenge before this whole thing happened. And it was like right around the end of the challenge when this happened. So I shared my after photos of my x-ray and this girl was like, I have a rod in my femur too. She's in Nebraska. I reached out to her. She does CrossFit. She's hit PRs since the accident. And that was five years ago. So it gives me hope that like, okay. And clearly for you, I mean, you run mm -hmm. like you're very much an athlete. Yeah. I, I ran six miles this morning, 13 miles on Sunday, 12 miles on Saturday and nine miles on Friday. So since the weekend, whatever that is, the math, like 30 something miles. Oh, and I, I got a speeding ticket this morning on my way to run. <laughs> no. Yeah. yeah, I'll show the back of it. <laughs> yeah, right here. But they wrote it as impeding traffic. Um, it's a, one of those weird roads. It was four four fifty in the morning. It's one of those weird roads Oof. where the ro I drive it all the time. You leave a town and it's 30 miles an hour as like you're exiting the neighborhood. But then and even though you're on the fast road and then it goes to 40 and then it goes to 45. So it's, I'm trying to get to a place to run at five in the morning uh, with one of my running partners and I'm not late and I just turn and it's pitch black and I'm just driving and I get to the mid 40s. And I see the cop on the left and I'm like, I look down and it said like 46 or 47. And I, and I'm like, I couldn't see the signs, but I know it's 30 for that first quarter mile. And I get pulled over and he's like, do you know what you're doing? And I said, no, I played dumb. <laughs> I kind of, I kind of knew, <laughs> you know, and I haven't, I haven't been pulled over for speeding since 2009. And because I had a clean driving record, I was polite. I got I got impeding traffic. That's all I'll say. Dang. So no points. More money. Yeah. But really, I don't want my insurance to go up. So if you're out there, um, State Farm, <laughs> it wasn't me. <laughs> I was going to say, whenever they come up and they're like, do you know why I pulled you over? I'm like, what is the best thing for me to do right now? Like, I think I watch a lot of these. Uh, clips on like Facebook and YouTube, essentially you should never admit, even if you think, you know, never, never admit let, because that if you admit guilt, it's like admissible in court. Yeah. So just say, no, yeah, I, you know, why, why? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm no, I'm no legal expert, but yeah. don't, don't say I was going hundred miles an hour. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, um, one of the other interesting things, cause I'm, you know, I'm more of the human interest and I'm sure that you get technical questions all the time, but I really think it's interesting how you are so disciplined and kind of did like a whole, um, lifestyle shift. I don't know how long ago that was for you, but why was that so important to you and how do you stay so because I mean, this can relate to anyone who's watching this. How do you stay so disciplined when this is something that in the past, maybe you've, you've struggled with? Yeah. Well, this goes really deep for me. So back when I was in high school, I played football and I ran track. And this is important. And for football, I needed to be big and strong. So I would always gain weight and muscle and I'd get up to like, 220, 230 pounds. And then for track, I'd have to lose weight because I needed to be lighter and skinny because I ran distance. I ran the mile and the 800 and, and the two mile. So I would go through these wild swings in high school where um, I'd be eating a lot, lifting, gaining weight. This is like Hulk type person. And then I drop all the way to 180 or 185 or 170. This was horrible for establishing my dietary habits. And also the way I was raised in Nebraska, we ate a lot of fast food. My family, we ate Long John Silver's, KFC, Burger King, McDonald's, everything. It, we, we just did. Sorry, Chuck and Becky, we ate like horrible. That's my parents' <laughs> name. So I go to college and then I had a similar scenario where I'd be on a work term for three months and I had nothing to do. So I'd go to the gym. I'd work out. I'd like 
be super fit. I didn't have any money. So I was eating tuna and crackers. I'd be in like really good shape. Then I go to Kettering. I lived in a fraternity where we had unlimited food. We had troughs of spaghetti and meatballs and we drank all the time. So from the age of like 15 through 22, I established the worst habits when it came to gluttonous overeating and the like periods of restriction for a purpose or not purpose. So I had weight swings of 50 pounds, like five different periods of my life, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. And that's not good. And as I graduated, I, uh, then started working. And before I got married, before I, you know, before I got married or had kids, I had plenty of time. I had a long period of my life where I stayed between 185 pounds and 200 pounds. And I was able to achieve that by essentially running 39 to 45 miles a week. If I could run that, I found that that was enough dedication where it, it would keep me from overeating at night if I had to run in the morning. So there was like, if I had to run, I wouldn't make bad decisions the night before. It's like, it's not just the burning of the calories. It's like, if I'm going to run, I'm not going to eat a whole pizza because then I can't run. Right. So I found that the only thing that works for me is a solid regimen of running. And I, I do a little bit of weight exercises, but that's just like, push-ups and some upright rows and stuff at the gym occasionally just to stay kind of fit. And I fell off the wagon several times and it got worse and worse. So everyone knows me in the early stages of Monroe Live as Fat Corey because I didn't want to be on the videos because I was like 250 or 260 pounds. You know, my head was this big. I wore like a size 42 pants. Uh, and then eventually I was in the videos. I'm like, screw it. I don't care what people said. And I was in the videos and being on camera was a decent motivating factor to try and lose some weight because I know what, what healthy Corey looks like. And now I found a really nice homeostasis. I'm not training for any races. I just try and hit my mileage every week. I, you already know the whole story about my lunch. That's all I've eaten today. Um, and I'll go home and eat dinner. And I've already ran this morning. So, and another key thing was I'm w one year and 15 days, no caffeine, none, zero. I used to drink a ton of energy drinks and pop. We have free pop at Monroe. If you come to Monroe, you can drink 10 Pepsis a day, all for free, if you work here. We have a whole fridge filled with all the different pop and tea and soda and juice. I avoid all that. I try not to drink any calories. So I was kind of a long story. It's just, I really have a lot of bad habits ingrained in the up and down. It's, it's typically more of a, more of a female thing to struggle with eating and eating disorders, whether that's eating too much or not enough, but man, I've struggled with it my, my whole life. And now I kind of have it under control. Um, and I'm trying to maintain this for as long as I can. Have you found that this lifestyle change has improved your work life? Yes, it has. Why? I sleep, I sleep better. I sleep incredibly well. Um, I used to snore a lot. My wife said I snored a lot. Um, my mental focus, not drinking caffeine, is one of those things I never thought I'd, it, it benefit my life so much. It's like the world has slowed down in a good way. The world, like I had been caffeinated my entire life. Like I never gave up pop, energy drinks, coffee, lattes, and caffeine has a pretty long half-life. I think it, it's eight or, eight or 10 hours. If you have one cup of coffee after eight hours, you still have half a cup of coffee in your blood. And after another eight hours, you have a quarter cup. So it takes like six days before that shrinks to a negligible amount. And if you have one cup of coffee every day, you essentially caffeinate your bloodstream forever. And there's a great series on, it's a master class class. Um, and there's this guy who does a whole thing on sleep. 
and he talks about caffeine and how it, it messes with the adenosine receptors or it fills those spots. So then getting your body balanced to, to where it tell when it, your body tells you you're tired, caffeine masks that, but that doesn't eliminate the fact that your body was tired. So that's hard to explain. Like when you're not on caffeine and you're tired, you should actually take a nap or go to sleep so my headaches are gone i never i haven't had i haven't had a headache in like nine months um uh i i don't have to go to the bathroom all the time like with caffeine i was pretty sensitive to caffeine i'd have to go to the bathroom yes on every flight like now i take flights all over the country all the way to texas everywhere I don't, I don't have to go to the bathroom before I get on the plane. I don't go to the bathroom when I'm on the plane. Usually when I land, it's like, oh, okay, maybe I have to go now because I'm just drinking water. Like the effect on my, whatever system that is, your, yeah. your urology or whatever, it's like incredible. And now if you're out there and you can drink caffeine and it's not a big deal to you, that's fine. But I struggled with an over, an over dependence on it. Yes. And that's really helped my sleep and my focus and um my teeth also my teeth because i'm not drinking you know all the food colorings and and uh sugar on my teeth my teeth have improved so. i'm really particularly curious about that too because i like you love the zero calorie monster it can't be that mm -hmm. bad because it's zero calorie and then you you oh want one every day. And so I'm just curious, like, why did you even want to cut caffeine if you are already running and seeing a benefit with so that? I had done a stint in 2018 and 19 where I ran a lot and was doing pretty well, but I kept my vice of the zero calorie, or it's the low calorie monster. I like the baby blue ones. Uh, I love them. <laughs> and I would run. And then after I ran, I would have a monster. Yeah. And I struggled with, I want to say digestive issues, but like when I ate, oftentimes after I ate, my stomach would feel uncomfortable, like slightly nauseous. And I just thought it was like a fact of life. Like when you eat afterwards, you don't feel good. Well, I realized, this is my hypothesis, it's not rooted in any science. <laughs> I would wake up and before I did anything, I drank a 16 ounce blue monster. I drive to work. I, I, and I would eat fast food. I drive to work. And at nine or 10 o'clock, I'd have another blue monster that I carry around with me. And then I'd save one for the afternoon. I was drinking three a day. I hypothesized that the monster, the chemicals, the food coloring, whatever, it's just a mixture of all sorts of stuff was wiping out my gut biome. And essentially, when I ate food, instead of having digestive enzymes in my stomach, to digest, I was working with like a, a, a small shift of whatever, whatever's supposed to digest your food wasn't enough or abundant or, or I was killing it or something. And once I switched to water, it took months. I'm talking two months before I would eat a meal. I'd eat the whole thing. And I literally felt amazing before, during, and after. And I'm like, what happened? to this chronic uncomfortable feeling that I had and now it's gone. And I also am not hungry all the time. I think when I drank all the artificial sweeteners, it like made me hungry. And then when I eat, I didn't feel satiated. I felt my stomach was upset. Yeah. It was, I, I don't know, I, I went back to basics. Water, exercise, fruit, vegetables, no processed low or no processed food. Point stage, mission arm asset. Shuttle is clear of the tower. Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. Shells. Shells. Oh, this is going to be... This might be a struggle. This might be a struggle. Oh my God. Okay. Okay. 
feel like this might not be the best shot, but we might as well do a run through. I get overheated so easily. Let me breathe first. Let's see, that was, that was a cold read, okay? That was a one take wonder, okay? Now I'm just hoping that it was in frame because it's, uh, as you can hear, it's very hard to set these things up. I wanna say that for a one take wonder, that wasn't that bad. And this is so freaking exhausting. I'm sorry, I'm only gonna do one. I forgot my freaking prop, man. Someone was kind enough to send a bunch of Tesla Hot Wheels and I finally have a Cybertruck. So uh, I meant to use this as a prop, but um, whatever, I'm just gonna go edit the video. <laughs> but whoever sent these, I've received a few like packages that have no name, so I don't know who to thank, but whoever you are, thank you. This is really cool. Um, definitely been, Wanting to have one of these, couldn't find them in the stores. Um, so yeah, thank you for it.